Did I miss anybody? Do, 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 do. All right, it's three after the hour. Let's get the fun started. We're at 14 people. All right. Let's see, AI skip. Okay, anything from the community anybody want to bring up? All right, SDK stuff. Uh, we did not have a phone call last week, so I don't think there's anything to talk about. However, we do have a phone call scheduled for today. I don't know if we have any topics to bring up, but we do have one scheduled if you guys want to join that. Um, incubator, next week, I believe Tuesday, we'll be doing the presentation for incubator status for the project. Still looking for more end users. If you guys want to add any to the list, otherwise I believe we're ready to go. If you haven't looked at it yet, the proposal is here. Uh, have any edits, just let me know and I'll try to make them. Uh, KubeCon, we have the two sessions. We did two big sessions, one for cloud events, one for serverless. Um, and I have the outline of, of what we're gonna talk about there. Um, feel free to make any edits you want. Add, stick your name somewhere around there if you wanna join in the presentation side of things. I don't believe anybody's done so yet. Um, but we, do, we still have time, so be thinking about that. Also, uh, Chris Anacek was on last week, but he didn't really say anything, um, but he added this to the agenda, and that's, it looks like you will have a serverless practitioner summit the same way we did in Barcelona, I believe, earlier this year. Uh, it is planning on being a one-day event, all day, co-located, as you can see, on Monday, November 18th. Uh, the CFP for that is supposed to go out some point this week. I don't know for sure when, but it, that's the rumor. It'll go out this week. I believe they're planning on making it just one long track, so they're not going to have breakouts. Um, but I've also heard conflicting stories, so um, be prepared and keep an eye out for the CFP if you guys want to submit something. All right. Any other topics we want to bring up before we jump into PRs? All right, let's get right to it then. Um, extensions PRs are the first. So let's talk about this one. Uh, okay, this one I thought might be easy. Klaus is not on. So basically, in this one, if I remember correctly, he said, he removed one little bit, where is it? Just talk about properties. Um, he removed this bit because that implies, um, wait a minute. Yeah, this implies a multi-level extension and he thought that was misleading because we don't allow maps or anything like that anymore. So he just basically removed this sentence. It seemed like a very safe change to me. Anybody have any questions or concerns about that? Okay, any objections to approving? Works cool. for me. Excellent, thank you. All right, fix up JSON mapping is next. Um, trying to remember, Evan is still not on. All right, let's see what changed in the last time since this one. Does anybody remember what changed? I think there might've been I think, he, I think the last set of changes he made in here related to data content encoding being removed. I think that was the biggest stuff. So here we have this section here. And I think the rest of it are just minor little nets, like adding Boolean. I think that's it. So I think the biggest bulk of the change is this stuff right in here. I'll give you guys a second just to reread that in case you haven't had a chance to read it. All right, any questions or comments or <clears throat> anybody want to say anything about that? Scott, is there anything you want to mention on here since this was Evans? Good to me. Okay. Anybody Good else want to? Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Question. All right. Any objection to approving it? Where's my mouse? Any objection? Easy peasy. Cool. All right, Avro. Um, let's see. Let's get to some really good stuff in here. All right, so does someone else want to talk to this one? Maybe Scott or Clemens, since I know zero about this, other than see a lot of the changes go flying by. So, so the, um, um, this is doing effectively the same updates. And the reason why we had a discussion about this is that um, Evan went and made data um, binary only. Um, so th this, this schema that we have here, this, this, this original schema was 
effectively just driving the ser Afro serializer so it can go in and take an arbitrary nested set of records and um, um, and serialize them. So it wasn't really meant to represent the um, uh, the cloud event schema, but really just drive the serializer. And so um, and so uh, Evan uh, updated that to include the new types that we have. Um, and then the discussion was whether data should be binary only um, or should still be be able to c contain structured um, data. And um, so meanwhile, he's made that amendment that data can now, just like with JSON, contain structured information. And um, so with that, we're now even. Okay. So this is good. I, I mean, I haven't tested. So since this is, this is quasi code that, um, the Avro serializer needs to work with. Um, I I will trust that that has been tested. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this this looks in in from a theoretical perspective, this looks right. Okay. Uh, that that's the biggest thing. I want to make sure that because I know you had some concerns about the previous version of this, and I want to make sure that those your concerns were addressed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me just see. I think most of this stuff is minor. Is this an example? No. Okay. Yeah. So here's the actual schema. I think this is a duplicate of what he had in the spec. Yep. And just to be clear, this text in here looks right to everybody. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Oh, Jim, your hands up. Yeah. Just a quick one, maybe Clemens. Um, in the JSON binding, you know, you you sort of or transport, you'd extended that to cover explicit, you know, base sixty four versus data. Um, it, do you think we need to follow the same model here? No, you could, but you could embed you could embed either in this structure as well. Yeah. So the special problem with JSON is that it can't natively represent binary, while Avro can. Oh, okay. So, All right. So, so that's true for that's true for MQP, um, where so in MQP, so we have the split in MQP as well that's similar to JSON, but we have that because of the the typical usage uh, usage pattern in MQP. Typically, in MQP, you uh, transfer pure binary data in in data, and then if you have structured information, you put that into value. So MQP kind of distinguishes between the two. For JSON, we have that split because JSON has no way of representing binary data at all. So you have to go and put that into some string encoding. So we're signaling that here. And if you look at that text that we have here, that basically says um, if it's binary, represent it as binary, and otherwise, you know, construct a um, you know, construct a union, which effectively use use the the native data types. The, the way how this turns out is that specifically for Afro is that whatever you have in your hands as, as data, well, if that is, is binary or if that's structured, you basically assign to the, to the data property and then have the serializer deal with them. Okay, so I got that. Um, so can the data be another Avro object or does it have yes. to be a serialized Avro object? It can be, no, no, it can be. So with, with the change that we have here, it can be um, any, Effectively, you you can you can stick any object graph that the that your Avro serializer understands. You can put that in here, and that will be just serialized out as as a data structure. That's what that recursive schema does. Okay, cool. All right. So you, this would be you know, uh, and I guess I had some offline chats with Scott last week around Proto. This would be the a model we could replicate into the Proto structures as well. That when we redo Protobuf. Yeah, correct. That's that's what that's what the protobuf uh, schema should do. I don't know how flexible for protobuf is for these sort of uh, recursive, quasi tagged um, uh, encodings, but that's that's what the goal that's what the goal ought to be. Cool. We can use. I think there's smoke and mirrors we can use there. Uh, <laughs> Scott can put me right, but yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, comments for answering that. Any other questions, comments? Okay, any objection to approving that? Cool, easy. All right, next. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't quite sure which one to tackle next. Since this one may take a while, um, let's first at least bring up Evan's 
PR. And maybe Scott, you can talk to this one and explain why he's suggesting that we remove it at least temporarily. Yeah, we've changed the how data works. And I think the current the current proto only understands uh, extensions as they were, and we've changed a couple of those formats. And uh, nobody on our side has bandwidth to fix up the proto definition. So rather than uh, rather than lock in uh, a V1 version of proto that we would have to support grudgingly for the rest of time, uh, we're we're opting to just delete this and then add it when it's uh, when somebody has bandwidth. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions about that? If we can, if we don't have bandwidth to fix it, that's the right way to do it. Yeah. Okay. And, and since and since we since we have a modular structure. Um, and effectively all the, we can add um, bindings to both transports and um, uh, encodings practically at any time. Um, I don't think that's, that's too terrible. Mm -hmm. But we can basically, it, it, we can add a protobuf and a CBOR and whatever encoding as a 1.0 version, um, basically at any point in the future. Okay, anybody else have any? Oh, sorry, Mark, your hands up. And, and we feel that this will not gate a 1.0 by not having this. Anybody want to comment on that? Does anybody do this? I, mean, as I, a... I, 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 I agree with Clemens that, you know, we can, we can always add it later as an addendum of, you know, one, this is a 1.0 spec for protobuf, but I just want to make sure that we're all clear that we can go out with without a protobuf format. Right. Does anybody view this <clears throat> view protobuf as a requirement for 1.0? Okay. Not hearing it. Ship it. <laughs> ship it. Yeah. Okay. So no, technically, don't he don't ship. Oh, don't, so you're right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ship it to not ship. Yeah. So technically, he opened this up yesterday. So per our rules, we can't technically approve it. However. What I'd like to do is suggest this, because this is a very easy change. Um, it may be controversial to somebody, but in relative to approval, it's either a very binary yes or no kind of decision. What I'd like to do is this, is suggest that uh, we conditionally approve the concept of removing it. <clears throat> I'll work with Evan to get the PR fixed up because it's not actually right uh, the way it is correct. I'm sorry, it's not correct the way it is now. For example, we didn't update the TOC and stuff or the uh, the main readme and stuff like that. But obviously those are minor typographical things. What I'd like to do is conditionally approve it now and give people offline until the end of tomorrow to raise any objection. And if no one objects by the end of tomorrow, that would have been enough of the grace period to then say, okay, we can go ahead and, and make it, make it happen offline. Does anybody have any objection to doing that? That way we don't have to wait a whole nother week just to remove it. Okay, so approve conditionally, wait until end of Friday. Oops. <clears throat> okay, any objection to that? All right, cool, thank you guys. Um, okay, quick question here. This issue was opened up by Alan. <clears throat> um, I don't necessarily want to discuss it right now unless we have time later. I just have a question for you guys who actually have looked at this one. Um, is this a 1.0 issue is my only question. Uh, we removed the data content encoding thing. Correct, and then it goes down to here and it raises some concerns. Um, in particular, his stuff about the compression is the one that really got me interested. So I took a guess at an answer.
Yeah, we 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 chose to effectively we chose to care about basics the base sixty four problem in the first place, um, and we have um, and we have basically punted on the the so we didn't really have we didn't really have a good good source for um, uh, source of reference for you know compression and all extra features. Um, so we. I think we punted on that in 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 the discussion. We can we can certainly. Um, it's it's arguable you can go and put that into the content type effectively. You can go and and make a parameter on the content type that says this is JSON, but this is uh, this is compressed or. Um, so, so what Alan what Alan is I think lamenting is the fact that we don't have that we now gave away a a place where you can add arbitrary hints for what further encoding has been done on the data we carry, including uh, compression. Yep. But um, I think that's something that I would punt certainly for one zero. Um, because I don't think it's uh, strictly necessary because most of the transports do have um, that feature and that and because we also support binary formats now like Avro, which actually inherently support compression. Um, so it's not clear to me that we that, that that's a high order bit and that's something that we can also uh, effectively add as a um, extension if we wanted to. Or um, if that becomes a press pressing issue, we can go in and f I think we can add that fairly easily. So, okay, so just make sure I understand. Your assertion is that if we decide to add some other property that implied compression or any other kind of encoding, we could easily support that because we have a clear path right now for supporting binary data. Yeah, exactly. So it ultimately it becomes a question of, of how do you, there's a bi so there's binary data that we can cleanly support, and now the question is how do you describe that binary data, and what you know what that binary data is, and I think with the content type, we already have a weapon to go and and very clearly declare what's in there, um, without having to resort to um, an extra encoding flag. Okay. What do other people think? Does anybody disagree with what Clemens said? Does anybody else think we this actually is a 1.0 issue we need to resolve? Nothing? Okay, I'm gonna assume silent is, is consent. Um, so what I'll do is I'll tag this as, uh, where's my cursor? I'll tag this as nice to have if we can get it done in 1.0, but it doesn't sound like it's a requirement. Does that sound fair? Yes. Okay. Any other comments or questions on that one? Okay. Um, again, before I get back to Evans, because that might be kind of big. This one I just opened yesterday, so we can't necessarily merge it. I might ask for this one to be merged or put into the other category, wait until tomorrow. But <clears throat> this is strictly syntactical fixes, so it's not actually major. I just noticed that when we got rid of uh, structures, we had a couple of examples that still use structures. So I just converted those to be just straight out integers. And per Vlad's suggestion, instead of making an extension two, I made it other value, just to make it clear that you can put other basically words in there without um, dashes or anything like that. And then the other thing I did is uh, for a completely unrelated reason, I was looking for the text that we had around naming, in particular, the valid characters. So I was looking for this section right here. And it was really odd to me that it appeared sort of in the ter next to the terminology section. So all I did was move it down into the into the content attribute section. Mm -hmm. So I put it in there right before the type system. It just seemed like that is a more appropriate spot since we're actually describing the names of a context attribute. So it seemed like a good spot to put it. The other changes in here was oh, there's one other change. Evan noticed that we had more than one data header. So the hashtag data was um, not clear which one it was going to resolve to. So what I ended up doing was <clears throat> make the definition of the word data to be event data. And there was another thing I did. Where's that? Oh, 
um, okay, so here's that change right there, event data. I then, in, the, in that section itself though, I got rid of the nested data tag or data header. It seemed like it was kind of pointless having it there because all we had was a small little section afterwards. And in terms of what it was actually called, we actually have it mentioned right here. If someone can come up with a better word than just data for the header there, I don't want to put it back in. I just couldn't think of one last night, so I decided to just remove it. Anyway, nothing normative in terms of changes, strictly syntactical, just moving things around slightly. Any, Looks good. Okay. Any, thank you, Clemens. Any questions or comments, concerns? Any objection to approving? And I'll give people until tomorrow to do a final check before I actually merge it. Okay, thank you. All right, now, uh, this one. Okay, so to refresh everybody's, actually Scott, I'm gonna force you to talk, I'm, doing, I'm tired of doing all the talking. You wanna refresh everybody's memory about what this issue is about? Uh, booting up, hold on. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is talking about how certain certain hops among especially HTTP assume that certain headers are called a certain thing. For example, tracing and the various types of tracing that you might want to do for just normal HTTP requests. The um, the the way the the spec is currently written, if a producer adds an extension, they have no, they don't have the ability for downstream converters to like, so, so like middleware pieces to turn it back into the header that's required for HTTP if it's been translated into a different transport and then back. So potentially the worst case you drop them and best case they become CE dash prefixed, which doesn't work. So yes, we have one we have a, an extension that's supposed to be uh, followed by all uh, receivers of cloud events, but what, what do we do in the case of just some random extension like, or the next version of the, the tracing header or if the tracing extension adds a new header, uh, we would have to change our specification. So we think this is a problem. Okay. Uh, Jim, your hands up. So I think, you know, uh, um, I believe it was Clemens that was touching on this last week. I, I think this is unfortunately an edge case for, for this example, isn't it? Because it's in a pure CE model, um, extensions will flow yeah, without any problem because of the way they get prefixed in the transport bindings. It's only distributed tracing where we have a problem because it's really trying to say, oh, well, don't, treat this the way you do everything else, do it a special case. Uh, so I, I agree this could crop up with other um, specs, um, but I'm not quite sure how you can account for it. I don't think we can account for every flavor of what might happen in the future. Um, if you start with a cloud event, um, you should be okay. You know, stuff will always flow across intermediaries. Um, it, it's only this sort of um, somewhat, I don't want to use the word ad hoc, but this sort of, uh, by the way, please do this thing differently um, that's tripping us up in this situation. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, I'll jump in then, I have a comment. So I, it, that, that last bit that what Jem said there, I think is the key thing for me. It's, it's the fact that we allow extensions to not follow the normal rules is actually the problem. And I'd like to look at it, I'd, I'd like to tackle that problem itself because I think if we can make extensions follow the rules like everybody else, then this problem goes away because it's very clear where the cloud event properties live, right? They all <clears throat> either in the JSON body or there's HTTP headers and they're prefixed with CE. And so what I'd like to do is something is, is tackle this problem this way. 
and this was actually talked about on an offline phone call that Evan, Scott, and Clemens and I had uh, earlier in the week, trying to hash through this, was to basically say all extensions must be serialized with a CE prefix, uh, just like any other attribute. From that perspective, they're no different whatsoever. However, they can have what I call a secondary serialization. So for example, in the trace example, you could still use the W3C trace headers as, as, as you know, however you want, that's fine. Um, however, they now become sort of secondary bits of information, meaning when the receiver gets the cloud event, he's only responsible for or, or required to actually look at the prefixed headers, the CE ones. Uh, if he wants to look at the other ones, he's, a, he's free to pick those up and pass them along as sort of extra other attributes. I'm sorry, or she, <laughs> they, sorry, they. Um, they're free to pick up those other attributes, but they're not quote cloud event attributes. They're just extra bits of metadata that have to be passed along. And the reason I say that is because technically that other bit of metadata could have been changed somewhere along the process. We have no control over that whatsoever. And in particular in the tracing stuff, as, as I've been explained, as it's been explained to me, the tracing header actually is supposed to get modified to actually grow over time to add more tracing IDs in there, I believe. So you actually, can very well in the tracing case get different values there. So um, you actually might actually want the two different bits of information, one being what the original sender meant to include as quote cloud event data versus transport level data that might get munged along the way, right? And so this allows basically for both cases to happen. But in particular for a receiver who has no clue about this extension whatsoever, they still have a very clear rule to follow. They pick up the CE prefixed ones, and that's all they need to worry about. Anything else can technically be dropped from a cloud event perspective. Anyway, that's my proposal here. Obviously, since I just pasted this last night, we couldn't approve it, but I'm curious to know what people think about that general direction. And Jim, is your hand up? Is that new? Yeah, so I, I, would, I would be behind that statement. Um, I guess, does this mean that there's guidance for SDK writers in that they should be providing up to the application, not just the cloud event itself, but also any transport context. Um, that then gives, I think, Scott, a pathway to, if, if he brings in something over HTTP that has W3C tracing attached, but is not in the cloud event, it's not also tagged with a cloud event prefix, that he still has a mechanism to present that information out to the application code. I, I think that'd be really good because I, I, I do think in general, SDK should sort of try to present as much data as they can to the receiving application, yeah. even if it's not part of the cloud event stuff. Uh, obviously, they'll use the discretion not to, you know, to, to pick and choose what data they, they maybe want to exclude. But in general, I do think that'd be good guidance, yes. That's just me. Scott, your hands up. Yeah, I already exposed a, a tr transport context because it became very clear that you need this data. Yeah, I, I think it's that, for but with the, so the issue is that when you uh, transition between HTTP to another transport and then back to HTTP, you need a lot of smarts in that receive adapter to turn it back into the intended request. Yeah, and for like for the um, uh, C sharp, the the pending C sharp revision for one oh, I think um, I'll also it's fairly easy to uh, take the 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 context from where you from where the cloud event came, and link that into um, the cloud event object. So you can basically you need to have a property that's called context, and then that has you know either an HTTP um, request in it or it has uh, an MQP message in it where you can basically then poke around and get uh, at transport headers. So that's probably what it's going to be. Yeah, but Scott, I think if I understood what you're saying before, you wanted, you were, you were hoping for a mechanism that said uh, some piece of middleware that maybe isn't aware of cloud events can still know about this unknown extension that doesn't have a CE prefix and still know to sort of carry that along in some way. Right, as, as a pseudo cloud event thing. And right. so I'm not take sure. the, the trace idea. Uh, if you have HTTP to AMQP and back to HTTP, 
the that second HTTP hop is not going to have that trace header because the unless you explicitly have custom code to hydrate it back out of the AMQP message. Right. But with this proposal that I have here, I think he would get serialized back out. What would be different though is you'd have the original value as opposed to a potentially modified value because of the previous hops, right? The value comes, but you'd have to understand how to pop that out. Right, like CE dash trace header is meaningless. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, you, you are correct. So then the, yeah. This, this is kind of a situation where Cloud Events is making a bunch of choices that will be incompatible with all existing systems that use HTTP. Well, but it, it, so I guess there's two ways to look at that. One is if it's an unknown extension, I, unless we try to do some really complicated thing and encode the serialization rules into the message itself that says, oh, if the next hop is HTTP, do this for this header. If it's AMQP, do this for this header, which sounds like it's a really bad idea trying to encode that into the message. I don't, I don't see how you can solve this for unknown headers by receiver. <clears throat> but if this middleware wants to act as almost like a proxy kind of a thing, it seems to me it's gonna to have to know how to deal with these headers or this information irrespective of cloud events, right? I mean, to take this trace header as an example, right? Even if cloud events wasn't in the picture, it's, it's trace header is either gonna get propagated properly or it's gonna get dropped, regardless of what we do in our spec. So it sounds like it's not necessarily our problem to solve. But, but that's the case of HTTP to HTTP proxies. And we're talking about AMQP to some sort of converter to HTTP and that, piece has to be custom. Right, but how would you solve that without cloud events in the picture? Well, it would, it would be custom. Right, that's but my point. If without cloud, cloud events, you have to write custom code. So with cloud events, you still have to write custom code. But my custom code is not going to work with your custom code. And, and that's the interrupt problem. So, so but that's, but if, it, if we're talking about the, the, since the tracing problem is one that is uh, um, important in this context, that's something that's really up to the trace context specs to solve and not necessarily for us to solve. And then I think one of the, where it gets clearer, and that's something we also had on that, we discussed briefly towards the end of the call that we had, is as I think, I think when you think about event delivery as push and uh, where the message, uh, the event, travels along a HTTP route through proxies forward, um, then you clearly have this parallelism between, you know, the, the, the trace context as it originated in the, in the, um, in the sent in the publisher, and then how it travels along that route and then shows up in the receiver um, for the HTTP endpoint that there it's pretty clear, but as soon as you have um, a push pull translation, where you push into a queue um, or you push into um, effectively a pub sub intermediary um, where you then go and solicit the message out, then the context become completely different because the, if you pull the message out, which means you do either an HTTP get or delete, or you do an AMQP receive a receive gesture, then that receive gesture is motivated by something else you start with a different trace context because your your motivation is that you want to have a message and you trace that um, and the delivery of that message then is part of that trace context because that's what it was motivated by uh, but the message itself the trace context that it contains is the one from when that message was published so those are completely orthogonal to each other that's not true in knative we, we use uh, different transports for persistence so wait, so when I, when I pull a message out of somewhere, no matter what, no matter where it's stored. So I have an event, I store that event in a queue or I store that event somewhere on disk. And then now sometime, la sometime later, go and, and pick that event up. The thing that's being the trace, the, the trace context origin for that operation for the HTTP request is uh, not that of the of the event. The trace context for that is 
me picking up some events, but I don't even know which event that will be. No, no, we, we want to know. We want to be able to link the producer to the consumer and all the hops. Yeah, but you can't because at that point, because at that point, when you are soliciting a request, you have you are soliciting an event, you don't know which event you're going to get. I, I can look at the metadata of the event. Yeah, but 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 you you also need to have a trace path for before you even got that event, right? You start the operation of the the, the what starts that context is you saying. I'm going to, I'm going to issue an HTTP get now, or I'm going to issue an HTTP delete now, or I'm going to go on and issue an H an MVP receive operation. That's where your context starts for that operation. You want to be able to trace that through and see how the deliver, how the solicitation of that event and the delivery went, but that is orthogonal to the trace context that's in the event itself that the publisher sent you because you can't know that at that point, you don't know which message you'll get. So I think we ask, have different systems. <laughs> Scott, let me ask a question. Um, I, I feel fairly confident that this proposal addresses, uh, well, no, let me I'm gonna try to figure out the right words to say here. I, I, I think, think the future proofs us. And that's well, well, I, I think, I think it makes it clear that for these non-special cases where someone wants their own serialization, I think requiring everybody to do CE dash, that, that I think works because every, we know exactly what header it's gonna appear or how it's gonna appear and there's no place else to look. We don't have to worry about anything. I think it's as, as Jem said, it's these edge cases where there's a bit of data that wants to sort of live someplace else because there's an existing spec that we're trying to adhere to, right? Um, I, I, I guess I don't see how, uh, how we can possibly solve that without doing all that encoding rules that I just mentioned to you in every single message for every single transport that may exist out there that a sender may or may not even know about. And so for example, right, if I'm sending a cloud event over HTTP and I don't know or care about the AMQB transport, I think you would require me to put some encoding in there anyway that, that tells you how to encode this over, over AMQP. But I can't because I don't even know about it. Right? Scott, yes, no, maybe? <laughs> I think even in AMQP, I think there's cases where you want to be able to filter on a key that doesn't have a CE prefix because it's existing infrastructure that knows that things that are labeled as prod go to the prod queue and, or, or whatever. Right, but I think with, with, with this proposal, you can still do that as long as the sender who knows about this attribute knows about the special encoding and he can then serialize it in that secondary form. Right, so now you can't use any of the existing middleware that you have that works just with vanilla AMQP. Why is that so? Because I think the question is whether if that middleware updates the attribute, if that update should be carried, should be applied to the cloud event or not. That's an excellent question, yes. Yes. This, is, this proposal is biasing towards if you have middleware that would update the attributes, um, it does not update the cloud event itself. Correct. Well, actually, be clear. I don't say that the middleware can't update the attribute. All I say is if they're different when they get at the, at the receiving end, here's how you deal with it. Because uh, we actually- Sorry. If you have middleware that only knows about the transport and doesn't know about cloud yes. events, then any updates that it does will get discarded on receipt. Correct. And I, 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 well, relative to cloud event processing, that is definitely true. And the reason I was okay with that, as I was thinking about this last night, is because technically any cloud event attribute that we have, whether it's source or any other field, right? If that data is created based upon other data in the message someplace, like so for example, let's say source was extracted from 
the body of the message or some other HTTP header, something like that, right? But they put it as CE dash so they get that interrupt that we're looking for, right? If some piece of middleware modifies that other metadata, there's no requirement on them to modify the cloud event attribute. In fact, as you said, they may not even know about the cloud event attribute to modify it. So it's technically possible that the receiver will have a source attribute that doesn't match that other bit of metadata that it was used to originally create or create it from. And that's fine because that's, what, that's the way every other cloud event attribute is, behaves. And now we're making extensions work the exact same way. You may say it's a problem, but at least it's a consistent problem across everything. Does that make any sense? Evan? I think that's a accurate statement of the problem. <laughs> I, I think there's a second way to solve it, uh, which is to say that any of these encodings um, are transport specific concerns and um, you use a transport specific mechanism. So you say, you know, hey, when you're encoding HTTP, you need to know how to undo HTTP. And if you don't link in the AMQP stuff, you don't need to know how AMQP gets mapped to, to and from cloud events. But even in that model, if there was some way in the HTTP message to convert the trace header into a cloud event bit of metadata, right? If the next hop is AMQP, but AMQP, if that middleware doesn't know about the extension, it's not gonna serialize the trace header as anything so, but a CE dash. So in 498, I suggested adding a header or something like cloud events mapping for HTTP that would tell you what mappings the sender did on attributes. That would be something specific to the HTTP transport. Right. The thing that is bridging between HTTP and AMQP um, is going to be a cloud events bridge, I think. I don't think there's a general purpose HTTP to AMQP bridging. So given that that bridge needs to know about cloud events anyway, it can read that header, do the transformation, and then it you know, has a cloud event and it, then it does a transformation to whatever AMQP's rules are. So right. we, uh, so objection, there is a generic mechanism for this. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah, so we have a, there's a spec, there's a spec that's in flight um, to be, become a standard, a committee standard, uh, which is uh, HTTP over AMQP, and that actually has that mode. So it has a it has a it effectively it effectively bridges it allows you to take HTTP semantics and bridge them over MQP. I was but, unaware of that. Cool. However, but even if that's the case, I still don't think what you described there, Evan, works because what if the W3C spec says for HTTP the trace header is serialized as it it is in our document, but for yeah. AMQP it's serialized with a Z in front. I don't know, right? Sure. Some other serialization. That information is, is not available to anybody unless that middleware happens to understand the tracing from the, 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 the tracing extension, right? Uh, no, I'm suggesting that there would be, so on the first HTTP message, um, there would be a header that said cloud events mapped, you know, trace, trace ID to um, whatever the, you know, W3C header is. The recipient would look at that cloud events mapped and say, oh, did, was there a header named, you know, WC3 tracing or whatever? Mm -hmm. Oh, I should trans translate that into a cloud events trace ID. Um, so for the first hop, all of those, you know, all of those traces line up. Right. Um, then when it goes to send with AMQP, it either knows about the AMQP tracing extension, at which point it puts it in the right place for AMQP. Or if it doesn't, it sends it as a regular cloud events header with you know whatever prefixes there are and um you don't get traces for that path along the way but you get the tracing information from the first part okay so you're comfortable with losing the w3c ness on the second hop well if the middleware doesn't know about the w3c extension got it um, i don't see how you would get the tracing ness got it 
uh, like I just don't see if you don't know about that extension, how you would apply that. Right. And if the second hop was HTTP, <clears throat> would you expect the the middleware to use that 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 special header that you added to 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 the serialization back out again into the special form? Not necessarily. Okay. So it's strictly so on read. It, I it's on a hop by hop basis so that the recipient can understand what the sender put in there. Okay. So it's just for the reading side, not necessarily the writing side. Got it. Yeah. And the writing side has to tell the next person what they did. Oh, if he has, if he does know about some other special serialization. Yes. Yeah, if he knows some other extension that has a special serialization. And as a matter of fact, for HTTP, we would probably always send a header that says, you know, data content type got mapped to the content type header. Got it. Okay, I'm going to let someone else speak for a minute. Anybody else want to comment on this? I, I better understand the problem now, so thank you, Adam. I, just one thing. I, when the tracing stuff was originally added, was the intention that it, uh, and maybe this is what Clemens was alluding to, is this meant to trace the context of the event or all the infrastructure that it flows through in between? Because um, it, it sounds like if somebody publishes an event and it bounces through lots of infrastructure along the way, I could end up uh, with a received trace context, which has loads of stuff in it that I have absolutely no interest in. Is that true? Um, I think it depends on what you're trying to get out of that trace. If you're wondering why did it take two minutes to get from point A to point B, um, what it did in the intervening infrastructure is probably really interesting to you. But I may not. But I may not own that infrastructure. Yeah, I may not have access to that. Um, that all that yeah. that that context under the covers. Yeah. If it flows um, through AWS infrastructure, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was sticking my neck out, yeah, uh, before it leaps into our infrastructure. Um, I may not have access to all the gory details of what's gone on under the covers in, in AWS. Well, I think that you could either send the trace to your, you know, if you're seeing an SLO violation, you could send the trace to AWS as part of your proof, um, or AWS could choose to cut all the traces that are um, in AWS infrastructure. So it looks like you go into AWS, you wormhole and you come out the other side. Yeah, so if we, if, if we look at tracing, specifically as tracing as forming um, effectively graphs, rather than thinking of traces as a straight line, then um, in fact, what trace context does is it, bas it basically gives you uh, a, a, an indicator of what was the cause for this activity, and then what we're doing right now, what we're doing with the trace spec, if we if we adhere to the 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 change that um, uh, Doug just proposed, is we're effectively copying the information. So um, the 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 reason for why we're why we're publishing the event is captured effectively in the in the trace context. And now we're doing two things. We're putting it into CE attributes, which is an end-to-end -end flow, which gives visibility to the reason as the publisher had it to the consumer without the intermediate infrastructure in play. And then by propagating it into the W3C context header, that now lets the, um, the, the HTTP infrastructure flow, makes that visible. And even if that now gets propagated over by W3C context rules without cloud events being involved at all, if that now does a, a, a transport change going to AMQP, that will get propagated. So you see the entire journey. And as the, as the event shows up in, in a receiver, it will be receiving that over some transport. You now have two, parts of, two, inf two, two pieces of information. In the cloud event itself, you're going to have the end-to-end -end application level view, which is simply the publisher did this because of, and here's where I will now, in just for, for my app, do continue to do that trace. And then you have a second view effectively, which gives you the journey that that took. And that is the information I would then, I would expect as, as Azure, or you would expect as AWS, if, if something didn't work, that's the context information that you will want to give the customer to give you to do a root cost analysis. While at the same time, 
um, the customer's own span of control is really what the what happens what happens with the publisher and the um, uh, the consumer. So you would not expect in that scenario that the transport would take the richer um, context and then drop that into the cloud event. So I think I think you can choose to do that. Um, at, and when you receive the events, because trace context is something. So as, as I said, I think of I think of the trace context as graphs and if, or trees, where um, you can split the context and 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 cause multiple things to happen based on on where you currently are. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm as I'm setting an event, I'm I'm capturing wait, I'm formulating an event and then packaging it. That's action number one. And then I am. Um, uh, and I'm publishing it, and then I'm also sending it over to transport, which is action two. And I think of those as distinct activities. And the send operation gets traced, and then effectively me uh, having sent that event, or you know, and then causing things with it uh, at the application level is a second thing. Okay, so, so, I'm so you can shoot. So, so, so but to to, to just finalize, uh, finally answer that. So at the receiving end. You can now choose whether you want to override the the original context and and take the entire context with you, um, or whether you only want to do the end to end thing with ignoring the transport journey. Okay, I don't think we're going to get this resolved in the next six minutes. So obviously we have to have more discussions around this offline in the issue, um, and probably next week. So let me ask this question: because this doesn't impact all extensions. It's just, as Jem said, those edge case extensions that are, have their own special civilization, which hopefully would be minimal, but we at least have one, we know that. Do people think this is a requirement to solve before we approve release candidate one for 1.0? Or can we go release candidate one without this being resolved? I, I think, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, does it, is the subtlety here is that we need to change the um, the spec for that extension to make it clear that it should be doing both. Yeah. Well, be... I, I think no matter, assuming we just don't close the issue, assuming we want to do something with the issue, I think any PR is going to not only require changes to the spec, but also to that extension spec. Yes. I, I think that's true. So the question is, I'm not saying, do we need it for 1.0? I think we do need it for 1.0. I'm, I'm asking whether we need it for 1.0 release candidate one. I guess my question is, do we want a solution that also works for data content type? You're, you're breaking up there a little, Evan. Can you say that again? Do we want a solution that also works for data content type? Um, you mean because the, because the information is duplicated? Well, because data content type is mapped to a special header in at least HTTP. Yeah, with my proposal, it would now get a CE header as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but my question was, is, handle, is making data content type work the same way in scope? It sounds like the answer is yes. I would think so, because I personally like consistency, but that's just me. I am fine with that. Oh, I guess your point is it's not just a weird extension thing. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a weird extension thing that's also in our core. Yeah. Okay, so what do people think? Is this a requirement for release, for release candidate one or not? I have an opinion, but I want to hear someone else go first. Yes, it is. Okay. Anybody disagree with, with making a requirement for a release candidate one? Okay. Yeah, Evan, it, it, to answer your question, I agree it is a little bit odd. Well, not odd, but I was hoping it would be sort of an outlier thing that wouldn't affect the core. But you bringing up content type is a good example of maybe it, it isn't just this outlier thing. Okay. So is there any objection then to tagging this as a required for release candidate one, which means we, oops, I'm looking at the wrong screen, which means our current plan here is it pushed out at least another week. That's the implications of that decision. Any disagreement with that? Okay. 
Um, in that case, I have three minutes left. Oh, I closed this issue. Consider removing the webhook spec um, because I couldn't think of any place else to put it. Clemens and I haven't. Clemens and I have not had a chance to talk about it. Um, and Clemens, I think you've done some thinking about this and couldn't think of a good home either. So f I think for right now, I just, it's okay to close the issue. We can always reopen it later if we really want to. I don't think there's anything preventing us from moving the spec later and deprecating it. But I wanted to bring it up here and make sure any, no one had any objection with, uh, with me closing that. Okay. Okay, so anything else people want to bring up before I go back and do the final attendance? We have two minutes left. Okay, um, Vlad, or who, someone pinged me offline, who was it? Okay, Vladimir, I got you. Uh, Javier, hey, are you there? I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I just said thanks. Oh yeah, okay. Javier, are you there? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yep, and Doug, are you there? Doug M. You have a cough mute, Doug? Okay, while we're waiting. Um, okay, anything else people want to bring up on today's call? Okay, in that case, technically this call is over. If you want to stick around for the SDK call, I suspect it will be a very short